It was a low-key week for Artemis News. With the uncertainty that the recent White House budget request cemented, most of the information we're going to get approaching the summertime here in the U.S. is on Artemis II. But even there, a lot of the imagery published this past week was from the first week of May. Hey everyone, thanks for your time. NASA continues to press ahead with Artemis II launch preparations, and I'll review the current status and recent updates. NASA has not commented much about the future of Artemis beyond that, since we learned in the budget request preview that the White House wants to cancel most of the Artemis programs after Artemis III. The full budget request usually fills in the blanks, but it still might be weeks away, so there will be more time to continue considering the implications of that future. For now, I'll look at what happens with the fiscal year 2026 budget whenever it is finally released, but let's lead off with what was in the news feed for Artemis II. With the rest of the current Artemis architecture hanging in the balance, the only mission that seems to remain a certainty is Artemis II. The White House wants to retire everything after Artemis III, but that mission might be delayed to the point where no one wants to spend the money to fly that either. Exploration Ground Systems and prime contractor Amentum are now preparing Orion and SLS for launch in separate locations at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. After a coincidence of high visibility milestones for Artemis II preparations at the end of April, beginning of May, things will probably be quieter until after the summer begins. The critical path for the schedule is Orion, and that was being configured for servicing most of its commodities in the multi-payload processing facility. Many of the commodities are hazardous, from nitrogen gas to the hypergolic bipropellants used by the European service module. That requires most personnel to be evacuated from the area, and the commodities are loaded one at a time. Because, for example, hypergolic propellant ignites on contact, and there's a long history of hazardous chemical leaks and spills. The goal was to finish all the work in the MPPF in about 3 months or 12 weeks. The spacecraft rolled into the facility on May 3rd, and the update from Kennedy Space Center Public Affairs at the end of the week was that the spacecraft was configured for servicing the service module oxidizer, called Mixed Oxides of Nitrogen or Nitrogen Tetroxide, and that was expected to be loaded by next week. After that, they would configure to service the SM fuel tanks with monomethyl hydrazine, and this was the planned order for what to service next. The order can be adjusted to the situation as needed to save time. For SLS, all the working elements of the rocket are bolted together on the mobile launcher in High Bay 3 of the Vehicle Assembly Building. Now the target for the work there is to fully check out all the SLS systems with ground launch processing systems. The SLS boosters and stages have to communicate with each other, and the rocket and ground systems also have to communicate. A series of interface verification tests will be conducted to make sure that the rocket can be commanded and controlled by the ground systems and the launch team that operates them. After that, a series of SLS program-specific engineering tests will be run to demonstrate that the vehicle systems are ready for countdown, for tanking, and for launch. The pieces of the rocket are now bolted together, but before they can run those interface verification tests, they have to be plugged in not just the boosters and stages, but the vehicle and ground systems. The ground will power up the core stage flight computers, which will then be commanded to power up all the other booster and core stage avionics. The ground will also power up the independent interim cryogenic propulsion stage flight systems and eventually verify their functional health and status. What NASA did release was footage of a couple of recent training visits to Kennedy Space Center by the Artemis II flight crew, the four prime and two backup members. Rare up-close footage of the SLS vehicle stacked on Mobile Launcher 1 in the VAB was published around a visit by some of the crew in late April, just before the interim cryogenic propulsion stage was lifted into place. The footage provided the first public views of the mated boosters and core stage from the zero deck of the ML, as seen last month. I went over the video in more detail for members, but here we can see that the liquid hydrogen tail service mast umbilical arm and ground side plate are connected and positioned for subsequent mating with the vehicle or flight side plate. That's still protected by a black cover, and this was at a time when the RS-25 engine replacement for core stage engine 4 was still being completed. I talked about this a few minutes ago, but this shows where EGS integrated operations was back at that time. 
This was the famous or infamous leak location of quick disconnects that caused several delays during the Artemis 1 launch campaign, beginning with wet dress rehearsal attempts and continuing into the first couple of launch attempts. Hydrogen quote-unquote leaks when the concentration of it detected by a sensor goes over a decided upon upper limit. That limit is non-zero, which means that a sensor can detect a non-zero amount of hydrogen molecules in a location they're not supposed to be, and that's not considered a leak, because a non-zero amount is acceptable up to whatever the limit is. EGS has implemented and instituted changes, some of which were used to resolve the issue for Artemis 1. The cavity between the two liquid hydrogen plates is purged with helium, and the upper concentration limit was changed to 10%, as long as there is no oxygen concentration detected as well. These plates carry more than just propellant between the ground and vehicle. They also include other fluids for things like hydraulic pressure and purges, and also electrical and data connections. In the video shot during the late April crew visit, we also saw them get into the crew module test article, which is a landing and recovery practice tool. The article is a full-scale simulator of the size, weight, and internal layout of the crew module as it would be configured post-splashdown. It was used in a recent recovery exercise off the coast of San Diego to practice end-of-mission scenarios. The CMTA is now back in Florida, ahead of landing and recovery exercises to practice procedures for abort scenarios. At the end of April, it was in VAB High Bay 4, where the crew who were visiting were seen going inside. Victor Glover and Andre Douglas just participated in the recent exercise with the Department of Defense called Underway Recovery Test 12 off San Diego, but the primary flight crew also went through the Underway Recovery Test 11 exercise early in 2024. In addition to footage walking around the zero deck of the mobile launcher, we also saw them up on Platform F, which provides access to the SLS booster forward skirts and core stage inner tank. Later we saw them on Platform E, which gave us a view of the core stage forward skirt umbilical and the enclosure around the bolted flange with the launch vehicle stage adapter. That needs to be closed out with spray-on foam insulation, and that enclosure indicated that activity was in preps or in work. Additional edited video was also posted of KSC exercises with the Artemis II flight crew during the first week of May. The first was out at the launch pad 39B terminus area, where the emergency egress system baskets would carry personnel away from the umbilical tower and rocket in a contingency scenario. The support teams and flight crew went through getting into armored personnel carriers, called Mine Resistant Ambush Protected Vehicles, or MRAPs, and driving them away from Pad 39B out to a triage area near where the crawlerway splits between Pads 39A and 39B. That would be where medical and fire rescue personnel would be stationed to provide additional assistance. As I noted last week, the launch team also took part in a launch countdown simulation of the tanking part of the day of launch timeline. One of the interesting elements in these videos, at least to me, is the real-time views of the flight hardware that can be seen on some displays in firing room 1 of the Launch Complex 39 Launch Control Center. This sim took place on May 7th, and here you can see the top of Orion in the MPPF with the Launch Abort System truss assembly ring and feet attached. In the background here, you can see part of the Launch Vehicle Stage Adapter in the VAB. KSC Public Affairs also posted video of a terminal countdown simulation that was run the next day, May 8th, with the flight crew also participating from the firing room in the mission management area. The video includes Artemis Launch Director Charlie Blackwell Thompson's poll of senior management and the flight crew, although we're only getting the ambient audio here. All right, I copy that. At this time, I'll perform my poll. Attention on the net, this is the launch director performing the final poll for launch. Verify no constraints and go for launch. EGS program chief engineer. Copy, thank you. EGS chief safety officer. You got MMT? I got MMT, too. Copy, thank you, Pete. Range weather. Copy, thank you, LWO and Artemis Mission Manager. And the MMT can verify no constraints and you're go for launch. Copy that, thank you. And CDR Launch Director. 
All right, thank you, Reed. Teams worked really hard today uh, to give you guys a ride around the moon. We hope you have a safe and successful mission. Uh, Godspeed and good luck. We also got a few shots of the flame deflector at Pad 39B in a PAO social media post on Friday, May 16th. A new set of metal plates is now installed and the images provide a few different points of view. Taking another quick look at the current status and near-term outlook for Artemis II, it's worth noting the caveat that a lot of training like these launch simulations are also going on behind the scenes in Houston with the flight control team. The flight crew is providing a weekly update on social media, but predominantly the updates we get in the news feed are on preparations of the flight hardware at Kennedy Space Center to be ready to launch. EGS has powered up Orion and configured the spacecraft for commodity loading in the MPPF with the large service module propellant tanks up first. In the VAB, I'm hoping to get an update on where EGS Integrated Operations is with preparing SLS and the mobile launcher to power up the systems in the boosters, core stage, and ICPS. Those preparations include mating umbilical plates and installing and fully routing wire harnesses, such as along the length of the solid rocket boosters systems tunnel and between the boosters and core stage. Vehicle power-up will start a few months of integrated test and checkout, verifying interfaces and performing functional checkouts of vehicle systems. The work in the MPPF and the VAB will extend well into the summer. The second quarter of the year will conclude in about six weeks, just after the summer solstice here in the Northern Hemisphere, and by that time we'll hopefully have a better idea about progress with Artemis II launch preparations. Right now, NASA is still aiming at a goal of being ready to roll a launch-ready Orion and SLS out to Pad 39B by the end of the year. Looking at the political calendar, we're waiting for the full details of the President's fiscal year 2026 budget request. Still, there was some reporting during the week that it isn't expected until June, which puts it after the upcoming holiday weekend here in the U.S., but it could be farther into the month. Kind of like what we're doing with Artemis 2, we can look ahead to what we'll see with the budget process. Also like Artemis 2 and 3, we don't know about the timing of the outcome. The process begins with the full budget request, whenever that is. After that, the first events we would expect to see are hearings by the appropriations subcommittees that oversee NASA. Those are the Commerce, Justice, Science, and Related Agencies subcommittees in the House and the Senate. Typically, the NASA Administrator testifies to the subcommittee and promotes the budget request in those CJS hearings, one in the House and one in the Senate. After those hearings, the subcommittees will draft separate CJS appropriations bills, and then the appropriations committees would mark them up by voting on amendments and then eventually the revised bill. Assuming the bill passes on one side or another, it would go to the floor of that chamber. That's the point in the process where things often come to a halt. Some appropriations bills are voted out of committee to the floor, and some never make it to a vote. Through much of this century, a separate omnibus or minibus appropriations bill that covers all the different groups is put together before the Christmas holiday. Sometimes that is passed and signed into law by the president, and sometimes, like the current year, fiscal year 2025, an agreement cannot be reached, and the best they can do is a continuing resolution passed for the whole year. In increasingly rare situations, both chambers pass appropriations bills, and the two appropriations committee members meet in a conference to try and reconcile the differences into a single bill. If the process got that far, then that conference bill could be voted on by both chambers. Regardless, in this century, fiscal years pretty much always start under a short-term continuing resolution, and that's the expectation again this year. Congress usually passes an appropriations bill or bills rather than a continuing resolution, and the difference is somewhat about the packaging. However, it could make a big difference for fiscal year 2026, depending on the timetable that the White House lays out for remaking Artemis. It depends on whether a continuing resolution will implicitly give soon-to-be NASA Administrator Jared Isaacman the authority to terminate contracts for programs and hardware that would no longer be used, such as Gateway, the SLS upgrades, and long-term Orion production.
In other news and notes, Starship Flight Test 9 is getting closer, although the order of indicators is different this time. The Federal Aviation Administration approved an updated launch license for Starship on May 15th, which in the recent past was the final piece needed before fueling the vehicle and launching. In this case, only the booster stage was at the pad ready to be stacked, but that has since rolled back. SpaceX posted on social media that the ship recently completed a minute-long static fire test, but we haven't seen the announcement from them pre-flight that typically provides an initial target launch date. The anticipation was that Flight Test 9 could occur the week before the Memorial Day holiday, given some of the air and marine notices that were being published, but now we're seeing signs that it's moved a few more days to the right into the Memorial Day week. When this next flight launches, we'll be looking to see that SpaceX has workarounds or permanent changes for the issues with the main propulsion system on the ship, which will allow for a full duration flight test. And as always, we'll hope to get a longer range outlook on the schedule to the Starship development milestones for Artemis 3, the demonstrations of the technology that will allow the system to reach the moon and land on the surface. Starship is focused on Mars, and Elon Musk has also pointed a mission to Mars in the next optimum transfer window. That's about 18 months from now, and would also be near a deadline for the Starship lunar lander to make that uncrewed lunar landing demonstration ahead of Artemis 3. Back at KSC, Mobile Launcher 2 Prime contractor Bechtel lifted the fifth of seven umbilical tower modules into place this past week, Module 8. NASA has not released any imagery or information of that yet, and given that the whole project may be terminated, there's some uncertainty about what we'll get to see in the next few months. Something that was also noted, but we don't have any way of showing, is that Bechtel also lifted the core stage forward skirt umbilical arm for this second mobile launcher into place on the tower. Thanks as always for watching. Click on the like button if you found this video informative, and consider subscribing to find out what's going on with Artemis every week. I also recently added memberships to this YouTube channel, and as always, thanks to all the people who have joined so far. I am posting additional videos there and more frequent updates on what's happening during the week. If you're interested, click on a join button on this page or on the main channel homepage. And if you're willing to make a one-time donation to support what I do, I would really appreciate it. I put a link to my Buy Me a Coffee page in the description. Your donations will make it possible to make more field trips to NASA centers and contractor facilities in the U.S. Thanks again.